So I'm Kristen Hirsch Pierce. I'm the ex SETU board member for the Society for Conservation Biology in the Montreal chapter. Um, and I am a master's student at the University of Northern British Columbia, um, one of Oscar Venter's students. And I'm here today with Dr. Dominic Della Sala, co founder, president, and chief scientist of the GEOS Institute, former president of the Society for Conservation Biology, the North American section from 2008 to 2014, and an internationally renowned author of over 200 technical papers. Welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. <laughs> Anytime I get a chance to talk to SCB students, it's a good day. <laughs> good. I'm glad. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> just to, to start off with more of the, the SCB-based um, kind of questions, how do you find it possible, or how did you find it possible to connect to such a a large group while you were acting as president for the North American section? Mm -hmm. um, my history with SCB goes back to when I was a grad student, way back in the dinosaur era. <laughs> I actually uh, was not at the first meetings, but pretty close to it. I think I joined in 1989. And so it was right at the beginning. It was a heightened period of biodiversity conservation interest that was really kind of springing forward out of the academic world. And mm -hmm. people had been interested in the term and what to do about what was happening to biodiversity. And so it was a good time for the society to be born. Mm -hmm. And it was a brainchild of uh, several people, including Michael Soule, who started a lot of this. And he influenced me in terms of how I was looking at the world at the time. And I wanted to get involved with an organization that was doing something about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And I got excited about SCB's mission, which is biodiversity focused and was applied in terms of, okay, we've got the conservation science part of it. Now, what do we do with it? And the society was very committed to having that in their mission statement and their core values. Mm -hmm. And every time I worked with them, I felt like I was working inside a mini United Nations because there were people from all different countries all different places on the planet, working at a common mission, having similar issues that they were addressing around biodiversity and how you can maintain it in, you know, the period that we're going through right now, which is a bottleneck for biodiversity on a global scale. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. And um, did you have any personal success or or great feats um, regarding connecting to larger demographics and, and different um, different groups with the CSB? Yeah, I think so. You know, when I was uh, president of the North America section and also the work that I did with the policy committee was focused on how do we get SCB more involved and more visible on mm -hmm. a global scale? I mean, North America is my focus, but I had to plug into are there other SCB sections? Because SCB has all these regional sections. And I would go into the meetings representing North America, but I'd be sitting next to the representative from South America or, you know, Oceania or, you know, Europe. And so figuring out a way to bring the sections together, I actually coined an interesting term. I called it transsectional um, conservation. So all the sections would get together, <laughs> the presidents would get together, and we would figure out what can we do that has a common theme mm -hmm. for the coming year for SCB. And the section presidents would nominate some projects and we would work together on those uh, from our, each of our regional sections. So one example of this, mm -hmm. 2011 was the United Nations Year of the Forests. And at that time there was a lot of attention that was uh, targeting forest conservation. And so during that year, the transsectional project was aiming at, can we get a statement out on the importance of the world's forests and the need for sustainable development and more protection? So we published a paper in conservation biology. We presented it at, I think it was the meetings in New Zealand at the time, the SEB conference in New Zealand as a resolution uh, that was backed by this publication. The resolution was adopted by um, SCB globally, and then that resolution was sent to the United Nations delegates right uh, before the climate summit that was coming up, I think, in Durban at the time. We wanted to get a statement out that mm -hmm. these forests were strategic to the world's 
uh, mitigation in terms of climate change, and the best way to address forest conservation and the change in climate was to protect the primary forests that were storing all these of this carbon and sustainably manage the world's forest system. So we had, I think, 12 principles, sent it to hundreds of delegates, and SCB, you know, had a global spotlight that was placed on forests during the year of the forest that was organized by the section presidents. That's and there's right. one more example. <laughs> So a couple of years later, we had the 2013 International Congress for Conservation Biology. It was held in Baltimore. And the section presidents got together and said, okay, we need to do another theme. Let's mm -hmm. do a theme on global roadless areas and low transportation corridors. So all the sections worked together, did a symposium on roadless areas, and that eventually led to a global mapping project that was run out of mainly the European section took the lead on. We mapped for the first time the world's remaining um, roadless areas, and it appeared in a paper in Science Magazine um, last year. And that was all contributed by the sections working together on getting a global statement out on these are the last intact parcels on the planet, we need to integrate this into the sustainability goals of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about that because it gave me the opportunity to sit at the table as a representative of North America, but be plugged into something that was bigger, and something yeah. that was global in its reach. And that's, you know, a couple of examples of how SCB can be involved on a global level and still, you know, have its regional sections and its chapters, mm -hmm. all the grassroots components working together towards a common theme. That's really nice. And, and that actually ties into uh, to the next question, looking more at smaller chapters. Um, how would you suggest the new Montreal chapter um, goes about reaching out for more membership and things like that? It is based out of Concordia University, um, so that's part of it. But uh, how would yeah. you... Suggest. <laughs> well, um, I haven't been in the conservation world now for about 30 years. It's an aging community. And to get people to come in and be the next leader of the conservation movement, I think that should be, you know, I'm, I'm excited when I work with the chapters and see that because there's a lot of youth and excitement. And these are the leaders that are coming in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to the extent that you can get people in your chapter excited about some local issue that they feel that they're making a difference. I think people would want to come in and participate. Now, what I've heard often when I go to SCB meetings is the membership dues are, you know, a cost for students. It's hard to justify that cost when you're on a, you're on a budget. But I, you know, what I tell people is, yeah, this is cost. And in order to have a society, you need to have, be able to support it. And think about what you're getting. You're getting a, a network. You're able to plug in to a community of scientists like yourself that are working on biodiversity issues on a global scale. And so there's the opportunity to plug in that way. You've got access to the journals. You've got access to the newsletters. All the benefits that you get by being a member and feeling like you're part of a bigger community. Mm -hmm. So if you can get people excited about, yeah, we're working on this local issue, but hey, you know, we're plugged into this bigger vision that chapters all over the world are participating in. I, you know, at least I feel like by acting locally, I'm part of a global community. And I think that's the beauty of SCB. You can go from local to global and global back down to local. Mm -hmm. Whether you're working in a chapter or a section and then scaling up to the global level as part of a you know, global community. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And um, now moving away, I, I guess, from individual chapters. And um, during your time as president of the SCB North American section, um, did you see any any large differences or comparing and contrasting the U.S. versus Canada's um, conservation priorities? Did you see a, a large difference between the two? Yeah, I did. And I think one of the things I struggled with when I was a president was getting more Canadians interested in participating in the society. And, you know, what I did to try to uh, bridge our two countries is I put people on my board that were Canadian. I tried to have a good mix of Canadian and U.S. folks bringing in the Canadian uh, part of the North America representation. And so I think, you know, over, over the years, we've gotten more and more interest from Canadians in being part of a global society. 
But I think there's a lot more that can be done. And I'm excited about these chapters that are springing up in different places, including Canada and the one that you're working on in Montreal. Mm -hmm. This is a way to kind of get our countries working together on cross-border initiatives. And if you guys can figure out some more projects that do that cross-border link, uh, and you know, this is also a section thing, so the section's working with the chapters to link projects across the border. Maybe it's large carnival movements you know, that don't recognize artificial international boundaries. How can we get our two countries working together on these bigger scale problems and get more Canadians involved in the society? Because it is a North America section. Yeah. And it's mostly U.S. members, so getting more Canadians involved, I think, will help shape the society's uh, goals and what it does with its conservation on the ground in the years to come. Mm -hmm. And um, are there certain things that um, Canada versus the U.S. were doing really, really well, or, or certain aspects that, that should be improved on that you could see? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, back when I was section president, uh, Canada was making a lot of progress on protected areas. That seems mm -hmm. to have stalled. Government's changed. And, you know, from a big monkey wrench into getting more parks and protected areas in Canada, because Canada was a global leader on that. I like to see that happen again. But I'm a U.S. citizen, but, you know, just seeing it from the outside, uh, more parks and protected areas in Canada. You've got a huge energy footprint going on in this country, and so do we in the United States, and we're connected that way. Pipelines, a lot of controversy around pip pipelines connecting us in terms of fossil fuels is not a good thing. How do our countries work together to kind of bridge that divide in terms of what's good for the planet and how to get ourselves off of this fossil fuel addiction? Mm -hmm. So I think that's an area that, you know, maybe we can learn from each other that, you know, fossil fuel addiction is not the way to go. <laughs> yes, and, and you actually mentioned um, changing in government. So I guess more of a political question. Um, since you, uh, I guess, ended your term as president, of uh, the North American section, there's been a change in, in government in the U.S. As, and as well in, in Canada. Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, any comments about how these changes in government might have changed conservation priorities uh, based on the, the political yeah. views? You know, I think our two countries share kind of a similar situation that conservation is blowing in the political wind. And depending on who the president or the premier is, you either have forward-thinking, conservation-minded person in power, or you've got a regressive. And somehow we've got to get beyond that push-pull because it's not sustainable. Because, you know, the losses just are forever. The gains are temporary. So we've got to figure out how we get it to a point where it doesn't depend on who the leader is because we're going to get conservation anyhow got to get it in everybody's best interest. And in Canada, you've got, you've gone through the same thing, the change in the political winds. You have, you know, a leader that wasn't good on the environment. Now you've got one that's better. In the U.S., uh, we had a good one with Obama, and now we've got a disastrous one with Trump, who's totally regressive, who doesn't recognize science, doesn't recognize climate change. And, you know, the good news about it is that by having people like Trump in the U.S., he's galvanized the scientific community. Mm -hmm. You know, for the first time in my career, I can talk about advocacy in the scientific, at scientific conferences and not be viewed as a, you know, a heretic. And mm -hmm. advocacy as a four-letter word because uh, when Trump got, uh, when was inaugurated, there was also a, uh, a march on the uh, U.S. Capitol where 400,000 people showed up. On science, it was a science march, and then two weeks later, it was a climate march. And, you know, half a million people showed up. That was a lot more people on the Capitol Mall for those two marches than there were during the inauguration of uh, President Trump. So, in kind of a weird sense, he's galvanized the scientific community. Mm -hmm. You cannot go to a science conference these days that has any kind of wildlife or biodiversity theme in it and not be talking policy, and not be talking about how do we get our science recognized in the policy arena. It's happening in Canada, it's happening in the U.S. It wasn't like that 10 years ago. It was kind of more in the background. It's more now, it's coming up more in the foreground now, and all the conferences are starting to figure out 
we need to plug this in. And so I think, you know, the scientific community can play a role in that increasingly getting more outspoken so that conservation is not on the back burner. It's on the, it's on the forefront of policy. Mm -hmm. And now, um, as, as a graduate student, we have to take a few classes. And one of the things that was mentioned in an introductory kind of class was how there's a disconnect between scientists and, and the general public, oftentimes how we communicate our work. Um, do you think this is the case? And if so, why? We're getting better. But, you know, overall, scientists suck as communicators. <laughs> you know, I'm just, you know, that's the way it is. There's a really good book by Randy Olson. It's called Don't Be Such a Scientist. <laughs> and he got his training in marine science and is an excellent communicator. And I recommend that you, you know, read that book um, because he also went to Hollywood and he was a motion picture film person. And so he learned a different communication skill. And the way scientists communicate is they use kind of a pyramid. Okay, so you talk about what your, what your main question is. Then you talk about how you're going to get your observations then you talk about your statistics and methods. Then you talk about your results, key findings, conclusions, recommendations. By the time you get to the bottom of the pyramid, if you're talking to somebody on the elevator, they've lost you. <laughs> you got to flip the pyramid. So you got to lead with, hey, this is what I work on. Here's why it's important. And then if you get questions, you've got all this backup. You've got the data. You've got the methodology. You always mm -hmm. talk about what your limitations are and your uncertainty. But you lead with your why it's important to that person. We're not used to talking that way. Mm -hmm. So when we get out into the real world, we've got to flip that communication pyramid. And you're on, you're on a, I tell people this, that you got 15 seconds on the elevator with a U.S. senator or some member of parliament. What are you going to tell that person about your research and why it's so important to them in terms of policy? So that's their world of communication. And we've got to figure out a better way to communicate that is different than how we were trained. Mm -hmm. and, and so that goes with um, our chapter has a lot of, of young, young scientists um, emerging. So advice on how to communicate their work from the start in a way to engage, I guess, the public. Are there a few tips or pointers? Yeah. It would be doing that, that kind of mindset switch and looking at why is it important policy-wise then? Yeah, make it policy relevant or management relevant. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I do, too, is when I teach classes, I, uh, I always have po a policy angle to all the questions that we look at in class. And one of the assignments is to write a opinion piece for the local newspaper on your subject, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, is it a county park that you like or your favorite hiking area or is it climate change? Get it out into that communication world so you can learn how to communicate in lay people's language. You can do it already um, at the scientific level. It's harder to do it at the lay person's level, I can tell you that. Because we have jargon, and we're trained in jargon, but we've got to get beyond that jargon. We've got to find a way to communicate to people uh, in a way that reaches their hearts as much as their minds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And... <clears throat> And so um, what do you see as a role for graduate students and early career professionals as we, as we move ahead with, with um, conservation? Um, how, what would you suggest for that? Well, you know, <clears throat> thinking back when I was a grad student, <clears throat> excuse me, I had very little time other than, you know, do my research, teach uh, as a TA or a you know, be involved in a lab or something. There wasn't a lot of time. So I, I'm def definitely aware of the time constraints that students have, particularly when they're trying to get a thesis done or, you know, pass the qualifying exams. And so if there are opportunities time-wise to get more involved, um, you know, do some volunteer work. Get involved with an SCV chapter or do an internship at an NGO or a government agency. Get some real-world experience. It's priceless. Mm -hmm. When I got out of grad school, I went and I did two postdocs because I couldn't find a job. <laughs> the job market was really tight. But it wasn't until I finished my second postdoc and I, I got a job with a consulting company 
And I never thought I would work for a corporation. At the time, I thought, oh, my God, I've sold my soul to the devil. I'm working for a for-profit entity. I got more experience in the five years that I worked for that entity than I ever got in my career because I was asked to solve real-world problems. I was asked to, <clears throat> how can we reroute this pipeline so it doesn't go through a sensitive plant community or destroy some endangered species habitat? You know, what can we do to um, minimize the footprint of development? So I didn't wind up doing that in my career because I went on and did more conservation biology work. But getting that real world experience under my belt helped me apply the tools of science in a real world setting so that I could advise people on what to do to minimize damage or to improve the environment or to protect it a special place. Mm -hmm. So getting some relevant experience, even if it means taking a year or two off, is priceless. Good. I'll have to <laughs> yeah. take that advice as well soon. <laughs> well, you know, the other area, too, is I've had some friends that have gone on to join the Peace Corps and have used their Peace Corps project as a thesis topic. So bringing the two together, getting real-world experience, you know, eating rice and beans for three years, whatever it is, and getting a thesis at it. And so you've got your research covered, you've got some money coming in for a job, and you've got real-world experience. That's priceless because then you can walk into a job setting and say, not only do I have a degree, but I did work for the Peace Corps in another country. I speak multiple languages and, you know, I worked on real world conservation. That'll open up a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Um, and I guess looking more at, at a question on more your research, um, as you have a background in, in fire ecology, um, would you be able to comment on why you think the forest fires in BC, Alberta, California, um, and across the, the western states have been so intense and, and costly this year? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, just to back up a little bit, I, I tell this story a lot, but it kind of paints the picture in terms of what's going on with fires. So when I was done with my Temperate and Boreal Rainforest book, I thought I knew what a forest was. I can go in the forest, and I, I saw green. I saw old growth. I said, wow, I'm in a wonderful forest here. A lot of biodiversity. It's unique. It's important from a conservation standpoint. Then I took a hike one day with my daughter, who was 10 at the time. We hiked up to this peak where we live, right in the middle of a big, um, severe burn. And all the trees were dead, so there was, it was a snag forest. And... We're sitting there eating our lunch, and my daughter says, wow, look at all the wildflowers. And, oh, look at all the dragonflies and the butterflies. The place was alive with woodpeckers and songbirds. And I looked around, and I said, you know, she's right. This place is, it's alive. It's a, it's a forest. It's a different forest. Mm -hmm. And if a 10-year-old could see it, maybe a member of Congress could see it. Man, was I wrong. Because <laughs> fire is so demonized. But all it's doing is it's resetting nature's mm -hmm. clock. The dry forests are uniquely adapted to be fire-dependent forests. They're as important from a conservation standpoint as the old-growth forest that I was standing in. Mm -hmm. And they're connected. So when you have a fire in an old-growth forest, you now have what we call a complex early cereal forest that has as much species richness as that old-growth forest does after maybe a year or two. Mm -hmm. So it's just a reset, and it's not a disaster. It's not a catastrophe, right? So we wrote the book, uh, co-authored it on uh, subtitled Nature's Phoenix because it really was literally a new forest rising out of the ashes. So from an ecological standpoint, these are not catastrophes. Mm -hmm. This has been going on since, you know, plants have been on the planet. 400 million years of fire influences on the planet. So mm -hmm. it's nothing new. So what's going on now, though, is not only has fire been demonized, it's being used as an excuse to log forests. Mm -hmm. What I think we're seeing is we have entered a new climate era. We're right at the beginning of a new climate era. We know this, the glaciers are melting, and we're seeing a lot of other changes around the globe, including in portions of the West, the acres burning have been increasing since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, we're still in a fire deficit. Overall, if you compare the amount of acres burning 
from recent fires to like the early 1900s, there were a lot more acres burned in Western North America than even today when people say unprecedented fire. Mm -hmm. We're still in a fire deficit. There are fewer acres burning, but it's trending up. The trend line is pointing up. Mm -hmm. And now it's a climate signal. And whenever I want to know where's the next big fire going to be, I just look at drought maps. Fires follow drought indicators. So the more we have drought, the more we have fire activity. Mm -hmm. The more we have climate change in places that are dry, they're going to get drier, they're going to have more fires. So to think you can log your way out of this is the wrong way to look at it. The only way to deal with this is get to coexistence with fire and have a rational energy policy and store more carbon in the ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about a rational uh, coexisting with fire, what I mean by that is we're going to have more fire on the landscape. We can't log our way out of it, so we better start preparing for more fire. We better start adapting mm -hmm. for this part of the climate signal that we can't change right and it's starting to really kind of ratchet up. So we're going to see more of it. It may double in places in the mid to latter portion of the century. And unless we get, you know, keep carbon in the ground in terms of fossil fuels, mm -hmm. keep the dinosaur carbon in the ground and keep the human carbon from logging in the forests. Unless we get to that point, we're going to see more fire activity in places that are already dry. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> And um, then I guess on a on a happier note or a okay. more positive Is note. There a happy note <laughs> well, um, are there any organizations or people that you think are doing a, a good job to advance conservation? Yeah, the CB is a good organization. They're doing great work. There's a lot of nonprofits in this, you know, in Canada and the U.S. You know, I think of the Suzuki. Uh, folks, and I've worked with them over the years, and they're doing some great work. World Wildlife Fund Canada, I used to work for WWF US. Yes. So lots of conservation groups are doing good things. The thing that worries me, though, is having been at this for 30 years, and this is kind of going full circle to where we started the story in 1989. This was like the peak, of, it was the pinnacle of biodiversity in academia. Everybody was talking about it. it was, there was a lot of buzz. Books were being written about it, and, you know, Michael Soule was really, you know, getting... Reed Noss was getting a lot of attention on it. So this was like the, you know, the, the glory days for biodiversity. Where has that gone? It's not um, talked about much as much today. Um, the, uh, there are curriculas that have biodiversity, but not as much as when I was a grad student. Organizations have changed their mission. <clears throat> that, you know, there's been mission drift. More of it's drifted over into climate change, forgetting about the biodiversity piece. Mm -hmm. And not that climate change isn't the, you know, the big driver of biodiversity loss, but to lose the biodiversity mission has been a change that I've witnessed, and it's an unpleasant change. So I personally look to target organizations that still have biodiversity in their mission and are still doing something about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So there are conservation groups both in the U.S. and Canada still doing that. There are less of them now today than there were in the 1980s and 90s, but those are the ones that I choose to work with. Mm -hmm. Good. And then um, just a, a question about, um, because you, you do still teach a bit, and are you still taking on grad students? I haven't in a while. <laughs> You're I a would, very busy man. <laughs> I would love to. You know, I've sat on committees before. And now I've got this faculty position at Oregon State University. I haven't figured out how to use it yet. <laughs> I'm supposed to be teaching an online course. And it's, it's a lot more work than when I was teaching a regular course to get ready for an online course. So I'm looking forward to plugging back in uh, because, you know, I feel like there's an exchange of information and expertise that I'd like to share with this next generation of leaders coming in. And I want to learn from them in terms of the energy that they have their communication skills, you know, the way we communicate now is a lot different than how we communicated when I was a grad student. You know, people are at conferences now and they're twi using Twitter to talk about a conference. Mm -hmm. I wasn't around when I went to conferences. <laughs> you used a notepad and you took, you know, copious notes. Now everybody's just, you know, character limited, limited and, you know, it's a different networking that's mm -hmm. taking place now. People are more connected and they're also less connected because they're not talking to one another as much. So 
you know, I think we have a lot to learn from each other's shared knowledge and expertise. Mm -hmm. So in the future, you, you might think of, of getting students or something like that. And if, if that's the case, um, how would students go about contacting you? My email address. Perfect. And yeah. We'll put that on our website. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if this has piqued someone's interest, that would be great. Yeah. They can email you then. Sure. Perfect. And is there anything else you would like to add or comment on? I, you know, I, again, I kind of look backwards and forward in, in kind of the, the uh, period of this more biodiversity awareness. And when I look at, and I've got uh, a new encyclopedia that I'm working on, on the Encyclopedia of the Anthropocene. Yes, I read that already. It scares the heck out of me. The way, the rate of change on the planet right now, is it's, it's a scary issue. I mean, most people aren't paying attention to it. And so as a father, I think, how do I communicate this to my daughters without feeling overwhelmed and without just, you know, giving up and going, you know, go play my guitar somewhere and just throw in the towel. And so I ask people to focus on the solution as much as the problem. Because if you get trapped in the problem, you'll just get overwhelmed by it. If you pull back and just... Be aware that there is something you can do to change the outcome, even if it's your backyard conservation objective. You're trying to get a new park uh, passed. You're trying to restore a, tree, a, a stream. You're doing something to contribute to the solution, and you're not getting sucked into the problem mm -hmm. because it can be overwhelming. The scale of impact right now can be overwhelming, and you can feel helpless. So I just tell people to focus on the scale that you can work best at. Mm -hmm.